There was some up there. You can run up to my office. Go up to my office. I think there's some on the shelf up there. Yeah, there's Bibles up there, too. <laughs> good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. A couple announcements before we get started. First, let me, let me welcome you to our uh, Sunday morning Bible study. We are studying out of the story. This is a work that I actually did back in 2007, uh, where I took all four Gospels and wove them together uh, in the life of Christ and put it in chronological order. I did it actually to figure out where John fit in, because he, unlike the synoptics, is unique in his presentation of the life of Christ. But we ended up over the long haul actually color coding everything, and that's where we are as far as the life of Christ, all one story. Uh, in chronological order, have to divide it up into groups. So we're going to be on page 38 this morning. If you have the printed version, if you have the ebook version, we are going to be at the cleansing of the leper. Much publicity. We actually, sorry, we covered that last week. We're going to be the healing of the paralytic. We read that last week, but we didn't deal with all the implications of that passage. So that's uh, Mark 9, or excuse me, Matthew 9, Mark 2. And Luke 5. So, everybody good? Collar? My collar's messed up? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yes? Page 38. Page 38. Okay, has everybody got a book? Everybody got books? Okay, good. All right. Uh, as far as prayers, any prayer... Any people in prayer that we need to remember in our prayers? No? Remember the family of David Brantley? He passed away this past week and was uh, we've been praying for him for a number of weeks. So remember uh, the family of David Brantley. Let's, uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of coming to this place and being able to study the life of your son. Help us to see the great things that he did, to hear the wonderful words that he spoke. And Father, help us to change our lives, to be more like him, to heed his word, to make him absolutely Lord of our lives. We thank you for each event in his life that's recorded so diligently so long ago so that we could know what he said and what he did. We thank you for sending him into this world. We thank you for his life, his words, for his death on the cross, for his resurrection. And we thank you that he sits now at your right hand making intercession for us. Be with us as we study, open our hearts, open our minds. Be with those on our prayer list, to those who are grieving, comfort, to those who are sick, if it be your will, heal. And help us, Father, that we might all do your will as we journey through this life. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, we finished the cleansing of the leper last week, and now we are moving into the healing of the paralytic. We did read the text last week, right? Now let's go ahead and reread it because uh, it's, it's a little bit extensive, but it's not too bad. And uh, we'll just go around the room like we normally do, starting with Sam, if you would, the first paragraph, and then we'll take a paragraph apiece. He entered into a boat, crossed over, and came into his own city. He entered again into Capernaum, and for some days it was during that he was in the house. It happened on one of those days. He was teaching, and immediately, Many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even around the door. He spoke the word to the Pharisees and teachers of the law, city by, who had come out of every village of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. The power of the Lord was with him. He healed the sick. Behold, four men brought a paralyzed man on a cross, and they sought to bring him into the way before Jesus. Not finding a way to bring him in because of the multitude, they went up in the house, uh, and 
food in the room for me to and when they had broken it up, they let him down to the pond with his cot into the midst of the people of the Jesus, of son of Kirah, your sins are forgiven. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason to themselves in their hearts, saying, Who is this to speak to blasphemies? Why does this man speak blasphemies like that? And who can forgive sins? And Jesus, immediately perceiving in his spirit and knowing their thoughts, answered them, Why are you reasoning so in your hearts? Why do you think evil in your hearts? It's just easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, arise and take up your bed and die. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the devil, I tell you, arise and take up your heart and go to your house. Immediately he goes up before the church of that which he was not doing on the prior to his house, or upon the house. Amazement to the world on all and the world of all. And he was filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today, and we will never saw anything like this. Okay. All right. This is a very substantial event in the life of Christ. And the reason being is because it points out a number of things, and things that sometimes people don't realize. You've got to remember first that who did Christ minister to while he was on earth, for the most part? The Jews. He came to his own people. Actually, when he was approached by a Syrophoenician woman who wanted the, her daughter healed, uh, he said, it's not right to take the food from the children's table and give it to dogs. And, of course, her reply gained his healing. And he, she said, but yes, Master, even though the dogs do get the crumbs that fall from the children's table. And he ended up healing her uh, daughter. Uh, also the centurion who had a servant. So he did, he did have communication with the Gentiles. But primarily he was sent to the children of Israel. Why is that important? It's important here especially because these are covenant people. These are people who are born into a covenant with God. We've got to understand something. Some of the things that are said to Christians do not apply to non-Christians. Things that are said to Christians, for instance, when John says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of his son cleanses us from all sins. If we confess our sins, he's just and faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's 1 John chapter 1, verses 7 through 9. But that passage was not written to non-Christians. It was written to Christians. It was written to people who are in covenant with God. They entered into a covenant with God. In the new dispensation, we enter into a covenant with God different than the Jews entered into a covenant with God. The Jews were born into a covenant. If you were a male on the eighth day of life, you were circumcised, you became in covenant with God, and basically you were in covenant all your life, and you were told as you grew, know the Lord, know the Lord, know the Lord. But God actually prophesied in the book of Jeremiah that there was a day coming in which he would make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the first covenant, for they shall all know me from the least unto the greatest. What does that mean? Everyone who's in this covenant, this new covenant that would come would be a covenant where they would know that they were in there. They weren't be born and on the eighth day of their life, what did you know it on eighth day? You know, you knew maybe pretty much nothing, you know, other than you're hungry and how to cry. You know, that's probably all you, you knew. But in this covenant that we're in, everyone knows him. It's a covenant of choice and it's a covenant of adults. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Why is that important? Because this is important. This individual, well, if you look at the text, he entered into a boat, he crossed over, came to his own city, and when he had entered into Capernaum, remember Capernaum is sort of the base of his operations. He sort of goes back there over and over again, probably because Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, others were from that area, and it made it easier on them if they needed to go make some money real quick and get some fish so the family could have food and they could take care of their bills. But it happened one of those days that while he was teaching, immediately many were gathered around there was no more room for them, not even around the door. And he spoke the word to them. So how many of y'all been uh, driving somewhere and you wish someone would let you over? You know, someone would let you in. You know, you got to turn right. You're two lanes over too far and you want someone to, and nobody lets you in. Well, this is sort of the circumstances here. It is so crowded. 
and nobody's moving. Nobody's letting anybody get in front of them. No one's letting anyone come in, so keep that in mind. Now, also, Luke points out something that's important here. It says, there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every village of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. Let me tell you what's happening. Jesus has gained enough popularity now, and everybody's hearing about this young rabbi from Nazareth. The big dogs are coming out. We want to see what he's saying. We want to hear what he's saying. We want to see what he supposedly is doing. Because this young upstart rabbi is having quite a following. And the big dogs in Jerusalem, Judea, all the villages, everyone's coming to hear him to see what he's saying and if there's some legitimacy to him being a teacher of Israel. And, and you know, right off the bat, they're probably thinking, he, he didn't go to school anywhere. How's this guy? And if you want to modernize it, Jesus would be the, the guy that shows up in blue jeans and a t-shirt and sandals, you know. And, and, and the three-piece suit preachers are going, wait a minute. What school did he go to? Where, where did he go? Who did he study under? Who, who, who taught him? So all of these guys are coming out. They want to hear what he's saying. And this is an interesting situation here. Okay. Did I see a hand? No? Okay. Behold, four men brought a paralyzed man on a cot and they sought to bring him in lay him before Jesus and finding a way to bring him in not finding a way to bring him in because of the multitude no one's getting over and letting him get in front of them they went up to the housetop and they removed the roof where he was and when they had broken it up they let him down through the tiles with his cot into the mist before Jesus I don't know how many of y'all have seen Jesus of Nazareth. It's a six hour uh, made a while back. Uh, I can't even remember who produced it, but it's actually a pretty decent rendition of the life of Christ. They, they, they mess up in a few places and they got a lot of stuff out of order. Uh, you'd think Matthew was consulting with them because uh, things are all over the place, but this scene is in there. And they actually basically, it's like almost a patio area and they're tearing off the roof, letting this guy down through it. And it actually, in the, in the movie, it's Peter's house. And Peter's getting really upset that they're tearing up his house to let this guy down in front of Jesus so that he might be healed. But this says something. It, it says something, to me at least, in regard to these men. I mean, this man's paralyzed. And, you know... He's got four people, and, and, and it doesn't say that they were relatives. They may have been. I don't, I don't think it indicates that they're relatives or anything, but these four men are willing to go to pretty, pretty extreme lengths to get this man in front of Jesus. Now, what's interesting, look at the second paragraph. Jesus seeing their faith, the ones who let him down. Now, that doesn't mean the guy on the cot had no faith, all right? Actually, I got a feeling he's the one that said, guys, can y'all, if you could just get me in front of him, if you could just get me in front of him, he's healing all kinds of people. He's healing blind people. He's healing deaf people. He's casting out demons. If you could just get me in front of him. So it doesn't say that the guy on the cot was objecting and saying, I don't want to go. I don't want to be healed. You know, I don't want this guy to see me. None of that. We, we don't know, but I, I assume he has faith, you know, because... It doesn't say he was complaining or he was yelling at him for taking him away from, you know, television set. He was watching Jeopardy and they came and got him and going to take him to Jesus, you know. So I got to assume he has faith. But Jesus seeing their faith, that they were willing to go to this extreme to get this man in front of Jesus so that he might be healed. And then Jesus says something. And the reason this is important is because later on it becomes an issue among people today and I'll get to it he said to him son cheer up your sins are forgiven you now who has the ability to forgive sins God you know you can forgive someone who sins against you and if you forgive someone if someone sins against you they don't repent uh, that's a whole nother story you know do you do you have to forgive them if they're not repentant well, God doesn't forgive unrepentant people, so I'll, we'll deal with that in another class, uh, dealing in another section here, uh, when we get to how many times should I forgive my brother, Peter event. But here, this individual is told by Jesus, your sins are forgiven you. 
Everybody knows only God can forgive sins. You and I can forgive sins that someone might commit against us, but ultimately the one who has the, where's the buck stop? The buck stops with God. And forgiveness takes place in the mind of God. We need to remember that. And these people know this. These are religious leaders. They have come out of all the cities of Galilee. They've come from Jerusalem, Judea. They are watching him, what he says, what he does. And right now, boom, in this event, he says something that they're like, whoa. Whoa. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason to themselves and in their hearts, saying, Who is this that speaks blasphemies? Why does this man speak blasphemies like that? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You know what? These people were right. They were right. And had Jesus just been an ordinary man, he would have been wrong to do that. You know, no man has the power on earth to forgive your sins. God has power to forgive sins. Now, you may sin against someone and he may forgive you for your trespass against them. But ultimately, the forgiveness that has to take place takes place in the mind of God. And God knows whether we genuinely repent or not. The reason this is important is because these people, one, they don't realize the second person of the Godhead is sitting right there. He is God. Christ is God the Son. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made that was made. That's John 1 verse 1 and verse 2. In verse 14, if you're confused about who the Word is, it says the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That's Christ. He was God, the second person of the Godhead, the God-man. And so he's sitting right here. He's exercising his right to forgive sins. And they're like, no, you can't do that. Because why? They don't recognize who he is. But it's important to understand something. Watch Jesus' reply. But Jesus, immediately perceiving in his spirit, knowing their thoughts, answered them. <laughs> don't ever think that Jesus doesn't know what you're thinking. He does. Why are you reasoning so in your heart? Why do you think evil in your hearts? Why are you reasoning, or excuse me, why, which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, arise and take up your bed and walk? So Jesus presents a problem to them that's really, how many of y'all have heard the old saying, the proof of the pudding's in the eating? Yeah, Jesus is basically about to prove that, that cliche. Okay, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven you or take up your bed and walk? Because if he takes up his bed and walks, that says something. And then watch what Jesus said. He says, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, arise, take up your cot, and go to your house. Immediately... He rose up before them, took up that on which he was laying, and departed to his house glorifying God. So here is, is a situation where Jesus says, okay, fine. You want me to prove it, that I have the power to forgive sins? Okay, it's easier then for me to say, take up your bed and walk, and the guy gets up. And he does exactly what Jesus says. He takes his bed, he goes to his house, and he's glorifying God in the process. I would imagine all of us would do the same thing. Yeah, Ro. I believe so. I believe all that he was doing all through his ministry was pointing to the fact. He, he actually, in John's account, uh, early on in the account, he says, me and my father are the same. We work. He works to now. I work to now. And they got mad because they understood that he was making God his unique father, that he, by being the son of God, was claiming uniqueness. You and I are children of God by virtue of adoption. Jesus was the monogamous. He was the one and only begotten of the Father. He was God the Son, uh, full of grace and truth. And, and yeah, he was trying to get it across to them. But you've got to remember something. They're coming from the Old Testament. I'm not justifying their rejection of Jesus by any means. 
He did more than enough, said more than enough. He was testified. I think I, I've got a sermon somewhere that says the seven witnesses to Jesus. Uh, it was required in the Old Testament that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Jesus had uh, John the Baptist testifying, God the Father saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The law of Moses testified to him. The works that he did testified to him. Uh, there was like seven witnesses. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head that said this is the Son of God. And they just they didn't get it. They're coming out of a world where God, behold, O Israel, the Lord our God is what? One. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. But they're failing to see the aspect of the Trinity that's not really clear in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament. But it is there. In the very beginning when God said, let us go down and make man in our image, in our likeness. Right there, there's a plurality that's there in the Hebrew that translates into the English. Let us go down and make man in our image. Who's God? What image is man made of? The image of God. Let us go down. There's a plurality there. For God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then in the Psalms, the Lord said unto my Lord, which is Yahweh said to Adonai, which is God the Father speaking to God the Son, sit here at my right hand while I make your enemies your footstool. That's quoted in the New Testament a number of times. So the God the Father speaking to God the Son. It's visible in the Old Testament. It's not as prominent in the Old Testament that there's a plurality of the Godhead. But they don't, they don't get it. They, they, one Lord, one God, that's it. All right. Sort of like the Muslims. The Muslims take a baby when it's born and they go out and lift that baby to the skies and say, There is one, Allah is one. He has no partners. And why is that? Because the devil doesn't want you to recognize the sonship of Christ. And it doesn't matter what religions he's going to use to do that. But this becomes very important because later on, someone sooner or later is going to say to you, when you're talking to them about being saved, the things that they need to do in order to be saved, someone sooner or later is going to say, yeah, but the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. Well... This event here is important because Jesus is saying that you may know that while the Son of Man is on earth, he has power to forgive sins. He had power to forgive sins here. What happens in John the 8th chapter? They bring a woman to him who's taken in the very act of adultery. They want to stone her. And they're trying to pin him on the horns of a dilemma saying this woman was taken in the very act of adultery. Moses says stone her. What do you say? And what they're trying to do is pin him on the horns of a dilemma. If he says stoner, he flies in the face of Rome because Rome says no. Only Rome has the authority to execute people. We're the only ones with the authority to have capital punishment imposed upon anyone. And if he says stone her or doesn't, says don't stone her, he flies in the face of Moses because in the Old Testament, if she was caught in the act of adultery, she was to be stoned. So what did Jesus do? Well, he stooped down and wrote in the sand. I've always wondered what he wrote. Marshall Keeble said he, was, he, uh, he really wasn't writing anything. He was just giving those devils time to sweat. And uh, so I don't know what he wrote. Someone said he wrote the sins of the ones who were bringing the woman. I don't know. It's one of those mysteries we'll find out when we get to heaven. But when they all left from the oldest to the youngest, it says they all dropped their stones from the oldest to the youngest, and they left. And only Jesus was left with the woman. And he said, he lifted her up and said, where are your accusers? And she looked around and there's none. And he says, then neither do I condemn you. Go your way. Sin no more. So is that a forgiveness? I think so. He didn't use the words, your sins are forgiven you. But he says, neither do I condemn you. So I would say that's on the equivalent of forgiving her. You know, he's not condemning her for her sin. He's forgiving her for her sin. But he tells her, go your way and sin no more. Now, the thief on the cross. At the beginning of the crucifixion, both the thieves actually railed on Jesus. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross, save yourself and us also. One of them, somewhere during the process of that six hours on that cross, realized that Jesus was different. Maybe he had seen him. Maybe he'd heard him preach. Maybe he was walking through a crowd and heard him preach while he was going to steal from somebody with a couple of his buddies. 
A lot of people speculate that those two thieves that were crucified with Jesus, Barnabas was, they were part of Barnabas' clan, who actually was a murderer and one who practiced insurrection. So they think it was part of that group, but Barnabas got off, or not uh, Barabbas, sorry, not Barnabas. Barabbas got off because they said, let us have Barabbas when Pilate tried to release Jesus. But regardless, one of them saw the way in which Jesus died. And I've got a sermon, another sermon, called Seven Statements from the Cross. And each one of those statements indicates something of great moral value, especially when he's saying, uh, to John, here's your mother, behold your mother, and woman, behold your son, and taking care of her needs. Uh, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. These statements from the cross are powerful, powerful statements. And the last words of Jesus. So somewhere in there, one of the thieves said, this is a, di this is a different man. And, you know, he's coming down to the end of his life. In a matter of a few hours, he's going to be dead Life's over for him. There's no coming off the cross. There's no salvation coming. And he looks to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says to him, he doesn't say your sins are forgiven, but what does he say? Today, you will be with me in paradise. So just like the woman who's taken in adultery, he doesn't say your sins are forgiven, but the whole thing points to the fact his sins would be forgiven. He was forgiven. He found grace and mercy in that very last hours of his death. I, I'm glad the thief on the cross is there, to be honest with you. Because if God can take a thief, what could that thief do for the kingdom? Could he give any money? Could he go out and evangelize? Could he take the gospel to the world? Could he, could he teach a class? Could he preach a sermon? He could do nothing. He had nothing to contribute. And there's a thief in heaven right now who understands grace and mercy better than any of us do. But the point is, is while Jesus was on earth, he was the executor of his own will. He, being the second person of the Godhead, had power and authority to forgive sins. He did so here. He did so with the woman who's taken in adultery, and he did so with the thief on the cross. It's not about whether the thief on the cross was baptized. Jesus hasn't even instituted baptism yet. He will do that after his resurrection and when he gives the great commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who believes not shall be condemned. He will say, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. That's Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Mark 16, verses 15 and verse 16. Those are the great commissions. Now he's instituted baptism. And on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached the first gospel sermon in the name of a risen Redeemer, those individuals realized they had crucified their long-awaited Messiah. Verse 36, Peter says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And they were pricked in their heart. Verse 37 says they were pricked in their heart. And they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter told them to do exactly what Jesus said they needed to do. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The reason this is important, because someone's going to say, well, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized. Well, first, the thief on the cross was probably in covenant with God. He was probably a Jew. Romans didn't crucify Romans. Actually, no Romans were crucified. It was against the law to crucify a Roman. It was against the law to beat a Roman with a flagellum. That's how Paul ends up appealing to Caesar, because they were going to beat him with a flagellum. And he says, whoa, I'm a Roman citizen. Now, he was beaten with rods three times. He allowed that. But when they brought out that flagellum that would tear you to pieces, it was a cat of nine tails, basically, with bits of bone and steel and all kinds of rocks, and it would tear you to pieces. What Jesus was actually beat with and why he only lasted probably six hours on the cross, when they did that, Paul said, no, sir, I'm a Roman citizen. I was born a Roman citizen, and I appeal to Caesar. And that, so they put the flagellum away, and he went to Caesar. Stayed in prison two years after he got there, waiting on his trial. But my point is simply this. After Jesus died, then his will comes into effect. I mean, I don't have a lot to leave loved ones in this world, but I've got a little bitty handwritten thing. I've got it on my email, and I've got it actually written down in a folder somewhere. 
that says, I want this and this and this and this to go to this and this and this person. And it's just a little will kind of thing. But let's just say I decide I'm going to put Sam in my will and Sam, I want you to have my truck when I go. You can't go out there and get my truck right now because I ain't dead. You know, when I die, you can get my truck. But you can't get my truck until I die. Because why? I'm still alive. I'm the executor of my own will. And until I die, once I die. And if you read the book of Hebrews, it says, while a man's alive, his testament is of no effect. But once he dies, that testament comes into force. Then his will comes into existence. And once Christ died, resurrected from the dead, put the great commission out there, now Baptism becomes the means by which repentance. Also, don't forget about Luke's version of the Great Commission, that repentance uh, should be preached from Jerusalem. That's in Luke's version of the Great Commission. Repentance is in the Great Commission from Luke's version. And also Luke 13, 3 and 5, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. That's part of the plan of salvation. Jesus put it in there. But we need to understand that it's after the resurrection and the ascension that the church then takes the great commission and goes. It doesn't matter that the thief wasn't baptized. He died. He was already a covenant person, most likely a Jew, crucified by Rome. He died in covenant with God, but he died forgiven by Christ. And that's important. That's why this event's important, because Christ was the administrator of his own will. He was the executor of his own will while he was alive. And if he chose to forgive someone, they were forgiven because of who he was second person of the Godhead. Now this didn't set well with the Pharisees obviously and I believe this is where immediately they're like okay th this guy's nuts you know. I, I think immediately they, they relegate him to the, to the realm of he's, he's a blasphemer. They, they bring that up to Pilate when they bring him to Pilate that he's a blasphemer. He makes himself out to be God. That actually scared Pilate when he heard that one and he went back in trying to figure out who this guy really was. Uh, but Jesus, by doing this, demonstrates his authority to forgive sins. And the fact that man got up off that mat and took that mat up and went home, proof of the puddings and the eating. Jesus must have something. That wouldn't happen. How many people do you see the devil healing? I see him possessing people in the, in the Gospels and throwing them in the fire and throwing them in the water to destroy them. I don't see anyone getting healed by him, all right? So... We need to keep that in mind. Everyone, look at the look at the last uh, the last sentence here, or the last two sentences. Amazement took hold on all, and they glorified God. They were filled with fear, saying, "We have seen strange things today, and we have never seen anything like this." Man, let me tell you, if Jesus was clipping along like this, as far as people knowing about him and going up slowly, right here. He takes a big, huge everybody. But now he's also in that very same event where everybody's going, wow, this is amazing. This is unbelievable. It's actually even scary that that kind of power is within a person. And then all of a sudden, at the same time, though, he's got someone saying, now he's our enemy. Now he's got to die. And let me tell you how they took care of problems back there. A lot like the mafia. They just got rid of the person. They just took care of them. Killed them got rid of them. And that's exactly what's going to happen with Jesus. They're going to plot, plan, scheme a way by which they can kill him and even recruit one of his own to identify him. Have you ever wondered why they needed Judas? Probably because everybody looked pretty similar. They all had dark skin, dark eyes, dark hair, beards. We know Jesus had a beard, not because of anything in the New Testament, but there's an Old Testament prophecy that says they plucked the beard from my face when he was being crucified. So they needed Judas because Judas was around them enough. If I take you to the, to the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, you're going to see a lot of Jews there who are dressed in black, and they have dark hair and dark eyes, and they have little curly sideburns now. I guess that's, I don't know if that was the style back then, but they do. And if I were to say this one's Tom, and that one's George, and that one's Harry, and this one's Philip, uh, then the next day take you, you'd probably go, well, I, I don't know which one's which, because you hadn't been around him enough. But Judas had been around Christ for three and a half years, so he knew who he was. And they needed him to betray him in order to take him. So they set this in motion, and it will develop. 
It will only go and develop. Okay, any questions about this section here? Any comments? It's good to know this, that Jesus had the power while on earth to forgive sins. That's important to understand. All right? And then the thief on the cross doesn't trip you up. It doesn't trip you up. And the thief on the cross, again, most likely was already in covenant with God. He was a Jew. Um, the call of Matthew. Two short paragraphs. Let's go ahead and hit that. Who, uh, who left off? Raul. Oh. Okay, so here we have the call of Matthew. Now Matthew is a tax collector. You think they were, in pop they were popular back then? <laughs> no. no, Jesus actually will even tell a story about a publican, which is a tax collector, and a Pharisee who go up to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee is like, Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other people. I'm not like this guy. You know, I do this, and I do this, and I do this, and I'm a good guy, and I'm glad you got me, and you ought to be glad you got me. And the publican would not so much as lift his eyes to heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. So Jesus would even use that in a parable to point to the fact that they were looked upon very harshly. They actually were looked upon, publicans, tax collectors, were looked upon as traitors to the nation. Because see, what happens is when Rome comes down and descends on a nation, overwhelms, conquers that nation, Rome wants taxes. They want goods. They want gold. They want stuff. And how do they get it? They have to get some of their people, of whatever conquered nation it is, to basically be the collectors of that. And then it will be eventually transported to Rome or utilized by Rome in the local area. So tax collectors were looked upon as outcasts, traitors, traitors to the nation of Israel. And here Jesus, you know, if you were consulting Jesus on his ministry, you'd probably say, that's not a good choice. That's not a good cabinet pick, Lord. You know, you don't want them in your administration, all right? They're bad news, man. They got bad backgrounds. They're, they're bad people to have. You go pick that, a lot of people are going to turn away from you. You think Jesus thought about something like that? No. I believe that Jesus picked the disciples based on heart, on the condition of their heart. And one of them, one of them, even out of those 12, one of them, his heart wasn't right. And Jesus knew that. He was still picked, but I think he was picked because the prophecies had to be fulfilled. One who eats bread with me will lift up his hill against me. The price of him was considered 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. All of those prophecies had to come forth and be fulfilled. But here, Matthew, being a tax collector, Jesus simply says to him, this is what sort of gets me. A tax collector named Matthew, he said, follow me. He just simply told him, follow me. And he left everything and followed him. So what makes you think, why, why do you think Matthew did this? Where he just leaves his, his work basically and just follows, he leaves everything. Of course, uh, Luke points out, uh, sitting in the tax office, he says, follow me, he left everything and rose up and followed him. How, how come? Huh? He probably heard something probably heard about what had just happened at Capernaum when he was uh, healing the man who had been sick on the cot and rise up, your sins are forgiven you, take up your bed, go home. He's probably heard that. People are coming from all over. Just because someone does something that is not Christian doesn't mean that God can't reach them. It doesn't mean that uh, they can't be reached with the gospel and their lives be changed. I've told the story of a, a friend of mine uh, who I met basically in a prison ministry. And he was the one leading that prison ministry. When I found out later the reason he was leading the prison ministry is because he used to be a prisoner at the very same prison that he was going to. And I would go to him and go with him on a weekly basis. We would go out to this prison on a Tuesday night. And, you know, it was a little, 
a little unsettling. You're walking in there with some pretty serious people, you know, who've been there for some bad stuff. But he had been a part of that group, and his life was nowhere close to Christianity. But when he was caught, convicted, and sentenced, it, wasn't, it was within a month or two. Someone came and did a prison ministry outreach, and he listened to the gospel, and his life changed. He's still preaching today. I actually helped him get to Harding University on a scholarship so that he could become a preacher. And let me tell you, that guy can quote scripture better than just about anybody I know, maybe with the exception of Avon Malone. But he is one powerful, powerful preacher today. But he wasn't always a good person. I'll uh, be around people frequently that are not Christians in different types of crowds and different circumstances, and, and sometimes they will, uh, they'll use some language that they... Uh, wouldn't normally use around a preacher, but they forgot I was standing there or forgot I was nearby, and they'll go, oh, sorry, preacher. You know what I look at them and say? I say, you don't have to say sorry to me. And I haven't always been a preacher because I want them to relax, all right? Just relax. I'll still talk to them, but I'll wait till the time's right. But I, I'm not going to sit there and go, oh, man, you've offended me. I'm leaving now. You used a word I don't like. You know, I, uh, I'll be more than happy. How often did Jesus put up with sinfulness and lack of faith? All the time. Even with his own disciples, he said, how long must I suffer with you, O ye of little faith? And I got a feeling, I got a feeling that Peter, being a sailor and a fisherman like he was, could probably paint the air blue with his language if he wanted to. I'm sure he could. But anyway... Let's take a look at what, uh, real quick, let's just read the next section and then we'll get into it next week. After he calls Matthew, Matthew decides, wow. First, you sort of wonder if Matthew was going, me? Me? You, 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 you want me? Are you talking to me? Are you sure you want me to follow you? Because I'm pretty much an outcast around here. Nobody likes me. But Matthew decides, this is a good time for a celebration. So he throws a party. And that's interesting. Let's read those two uh, paragraphs there. Who wants to read? Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Uh, Levi made a great feast for him in his house. And happened as he sat in the house, there was a great crowd of tax collectors, sinners, and others who were reclining with them. And they sat down with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. When the Pharisees saw it, along with the scribes, they murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do you and your teacher eat and drink with the tax collectors and the sinners? When Jesus heard it, he answered them, Those who are healthy have no need for a physician, but those who are sick do. But you go and learn what this what this means, I desire, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteousness, but sinners to repentance. Okay. okay. So this is, this is such a great, great place where uh, the famous uh, saying of Jesus that I have not come uh, to heal those who are well or call the righteous, but rather sinners to repentance. So we, we'll look at this in detail next week. Thank you for reading that. Uh, study this section of scripture. It shows up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but study it from all three and uh, pull out the Bible and look at each one of their accounts and then look at how it's woven together here because there's a lot here actually. Uh, keep in mind, the tax collectors aren't done, uh, or not the tax collectors, the Pharisees aren't done. The Pharisees see this and they take issue with this. So they've already taken issue with him forgiving sins. Now they're taking issue with who he's keeping company with. And that becomes important. Because I think a lot of times what we do as Christians is we sort of, if we're not careful, we sort of start hanging with just us. You know, we sort of like being around people like us. We like to be around people of like mind and kindred spirits. We like that. You know, it makes us feel more comfortable. But Jesus, Jesus didn't just hang around people of like mind. If he did, he'd be hanging around all the religious folks. He goes and he gets, in, he gets in, the, in the midst of the sinners and those who are outcast. And guess what? They follow. Yeah, Raul. Some of them think that they're not worthy, that they can't be forgiven. So they need to know that. Yeah, yeah. And then they start realizing, oh, that's right.
That's right. That's right. And you know, there's so many people out there like that. They feel like, I've done too much. I can't be forgiven. God doesn't want me, right? Somehow they, they pull themselves out of, for God so loved the world. They get themselves out of the world. He loves everybody else in the world, but not me. I've done too much. I've been too bad. I would recommend uh, read the story of Manasseh and all the things that he did. He even offered his own children in sacrifice to other gods, but God forgave Manasseh. Manasseh came to true repentance, and God forgave him. Atrocities, I'm sure they haven't committed. Look at David. He committed adultery with another man's wife and then plotted and carried out his execution. And God forgave him. God forgave him. There was consequences to those sins, as with Manasseh too. But the fact is, God is capable of forgiving us of no matter where we've been. God doesn't care. He's no respecter of persons. He will welcome anyone who will come to him. Uh, a prodigal son who leaves and squanders everything on riotous living, he will still welcome. So good places. And, and you know what? You're right. Some people think I'm not good enough. This is sort of like, hey, guys, we are good enough. Uh, he, he called me. So you too. Look at the crowd here. A uh, crowd of tax collectors, sinners, and others who were reclining with him. So, yeah, read this for next week and we'll get on it. Any, uh, any closing prayer request? Anything? Okay. Ron, would you close this in a prayer? Once again, we thank you for the opportunity we have to learn more about Jesus and the things that he did. We thank you for the for David for his presentation. We ask you to be with us as we go into the worship service. May we worship you in spirit and truth. For Christ, I pray. Thank you. Thank you. Those of you alone, thanks for being here.